Um, so can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, just a couple of things. One, uh, I am not using Keynote, so um, we'll see. Uh, I'm also not a front end guy, so I want to set the bar really low. I don't have fancy animations or any of the really good stuff that the previous presenter slides had, so uh, I, would, I would do this all from a terminal window if they let me, but um, so uh, I've been using Rust for about two years off and on. Um, I just recently finished a uh, WebAssembly book uh, that uses Rust. Uh, my day job is pretty much all go. Uh, I'm a huge Elixir fan uh, and I will take a few seconds just to troll the previous presenter about OTP having less than 10 microseconds cold start time, just say. Um, and then uh, I'm also, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a back end guy. Distributed systems are, are what I do. Uh, the less user interface, the better for me. So it makes me talking about WebAssembly a little interesting. Um, so what I want to make sure that you get out of this is some, hopefully some curiosity about what WebAssembly is and more importantly where you should and shouldn't use it. Um, did anybody go to the uh, workshop yesterday on WebAssembly? Okay, a couple. Um, other than the, the references to WebAssembly that you've had here, how many people are familiar with WebAssembly already? Okay, so that's good. It's, it's better than usual. Um, and again, this is a, lo a lot of this comes from me being a back-end guy, but uh, I want to kind of focus on the idea that WebAssembly isn't just a brand new way of doing JavaScript. It isn't a JavaScript uh, compiler or just another fancy flavor of TypeScript. And I personally think calling it WebAssembly and having the web name in front of it is doing the technology a disservice. Uh, and again, so hopefully you'll be, you'll, you'll come away from this trying to find ways to uh, build WebAssembly modules in Rust and uh, even host them in Rust. Um, this is a fairly opinionated slide, born of my hatred of front-end development. Uh, what, what we have with web development today is a lot of fragmentation. Uh, we have to deal with browser compatibility, we have to deal with different build environments, TypeScript, JavaScript, all the other scripts. Um, the bigger, our applications are getting bigger, they're getting slower. Uh, I'm sure we all use Slack. Um, I don't really need to add any more commentary there. Um, it's, as, our, as the web becomes more powerful, humans expand to fill whatever space they're given. And we're doing the same thing with our web technology. And so the more power we have, the more power we waste. And I think there's a better way to do it. Not a, not a better way to waste power, but a better way to build applications. Um, and as a back-end guy, the, just the amount of tooling and setup that's necessary to even get a basic hello world running on the web now is, uh, it, it's just ridiculous. The, the node modules directory needs to go away. Uh, and I, I think that WebAssembly can get us there. It's certainly not going to replace JavaScript, sadly. It's not going to replace Node or the Node modules directory, but uh, hopefully it'll give us a way to get some of the, the benefits of, uh, you know, the, the Rust language and bring those to the front end and uh, the back end as well. So we've been over, we've seen a little bit of what WebAssembly is. Uh, it's portable, it's a standard binary format. Uh, everyone familiar with what a stack machine is? The silence means I'm, okay. 
So there, when we run virtual machines, we can essentially run a stack machine or a register machine. And it just refers to the difference between how we pop instructions off and how we uh, access and read the, the data that we need. And WebAssembly, along with uh, Java bytecode and the .NET runtime, are all stack machines. Uh, the uh, <coughs> WebAssembly is uh, safe and isolated, and uh, its memory is uh, in a sandbox. Uh, I'll get to security and uh, hopefully, again, trolling the previous presenter of uh, about how secure WebAssembly can be in, uh, in a couple slides. But one of the important things here is that you can compile to WebAssembly from uh, any of the supported languages. And when I started writing the WebAssembly book, that was essentially one lang two languages, Rust and C, or C++. And now you can do C, C++, uh, Rust, Go. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, ways you can do it. You can, for whatever reason, compile JavaScript into WebAssembly. I'm not really sure what niche that's trying to fill, but it's possible. You can then interpret WebAssembly in dozens of different languages. And I think this is the more important part that while we all just assume that WebAssembly has a runtime, so we think the browser or the V8 engine, that's just one of many possible runtimes, and it just happens to expose a JavaScript API. Um, Go can host and run WebAssembly modules, so can Rust, so can C. Uh, <coughs> when you leave here and you just Im you immediately feel the need to Google WebAssembly technology. There's a couple of keywords that you, should, you can search for. I'm just trying to save you on open tab space on the browser here. Uh, the module is the portable binary format. It's the WebAssembly file, the .wasm file. Uh, WebAssembly has a concept of tables, and at the moment, the tables are only there to allow us to do function mapping. I think the spec has more room for advancement there, uh, but it's not really an area that I've dug much into. Linear memory, just big blocks of, of arrays, and that's where, that's how WebAssembly accesses its internal data. And in the browser, you can uh, you can give WebAssembly uh, linear memory or, or you can take it uh, from the WebAssembly module. So depending on how you want it set up, you can choose to share memory. And this go some of this goes to security. WebAssembly can only access the memory that you tell it it can access. So it's only as secure as the host environment. Uh, and admittedly, uh, JavaScript has a number of ways to be exploited, but uh, if you're running WebAssembly in a more uh, tailor-fit environment, then you can make it as, as secure as you want. A trap is just uh, essentially WebAssembly terminology for handling an exception, and imports and exports are the two most important things that WebAssembly does. Uh, imports refer to the host environment feeding WebAssembly hooks so that it can do things. Um, and then exports involve, it refers to WebAssembly, the WebAssembly module exporting functions so that they can be called by the host. WebAssembly has four data types, and that's it. And I just, I assume we all sort of knew this, but I want to point out that all of the other fanciness that we see sitting on top of WebAssembly is smoke and mirrors. It's all generated code. Being able to compile Doom and run it in WebAssembly, while fun and a great way to spend a day at work, is all code generation. There's nothing, there's nothing really WebAssembly about it. Um, so we have two integer types. 32-bit uh, and 64, and we have two float types. Those are the only parameters you can accept on a WebAssembly function, and those are the only uh, return types. 
So why do we want to use WebAssembly other than just the fact that it's new and shiny and that's what we're attracted to? Uh, for me, I think one of the biggest uh, reasons is portability. We have, we've always been, we've been given this promise of write once, run anywhere since the beginning days of Java and uh, we didn't get what we were promised. Uh, .NET, the, the .NET framework promised it. We didn't get that either. .NET Core is closer than Java was, but it's still not really the, the vision of having this universal binary format that anything can execute. And I think WebAssembly actually gives us a chance at finally having that. Uh, WebAssembly is fast. Um, the through some details about how the virtual machine works and how stack machines work, it's uh, extremely fast. But like I said, without the imports and exports, WebAssembly is really just a really fast calculator. It can do very little other than add and subtract and do math operations. What, what gives it its power is the host environment. Uh, WebAssembly is secure. Um, like I said, it, it's as secure as its host environment. You can secure the memory so that it isn't, uh, so that it can't be tampered with. Uh, you can secure the WebAssembly module itself. The spec has room inside the binary file for, I forget what the uh, metadata is called, maybe just metadata. Uh, you can add a digital signature to the file so that you can verify that you own or you produced that file. Uh, WebAssembly is safe. Again, it's a, in a browser, it's essentially a sandbox within a sandbox. It's compiled, uh, which means we get all of the benefits of Rust compile time uh, safety and type checking. It's compact. Uh, I think someone said uh, yesterday that, uh, you know, WebAssembly's format was specifically designed for download over the web, and uh, it is uh, surprisingly small. I actually meant to put portable here twice, just because I want to uh, harp on that one point. And WebAssembly is largely language agnostic. Uh, as long as you build something that can create a binary that conforms to the spec, it doesn't make any difference what language you wrote it in. And it doesn't make any difference what language is running as the host, whether it's a browser or a Rust uh, console application, or uh, as I'll, I'll mention in a little bit, uh, even serverless functions. Um, does anybody really need me to go into why we want to use Rust for this? Um, I, I, I do run into this problem uh, when talking to uh, different people who aren't at a Rust conference. Uh, and confidence, safety, performance, one of the things that I think people don't give Rust enough credit for is the uh, expressive nature of the language itself. Uh, in many cases, when porting code from Go to Rust, I've actually had the, the code become more readable, not less, and people just assume, well, it's a systems language, so obviously it's going to look like line noise. And that is a really old reference, so now you all know how old I am. So I was looking for an analogy for what WebAssembly is. And, um, you know, I was, uh, Feynman has this, had this saying where you don't really know a subject unless you can explain it in uh, very simple terms. And so for me, WebAssembly is portable brains. I can take the brain out of one thing and put it into another. And uh, assuming the, those two things all share the same set of appendages, it should just work. So one of my brains could be uh, running inside Kubernetes as an open FAS function, which I've actually gotten working uh, 
at three or so in the morning today. Um, you could get it. You could host this uh, portable brain inside Firefox. You could host it in a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you could host it uh, as a command line application or just a server application. Uh, one of the things that I used to do uh, before my current job was I wrote autopilot software for search and rescue drones. And you can imagine how hard it is to test the your autopilot software when it's designed to control physical motors and read from 10 or 15 different sensors on a, on a device. And if I, can, if I had access to WebAssembly then, I might still have hair. Um, the, what we get with WebAssembly is the ability to take that brain out of the, the, the physical device, maybe it's a drone, and put it into a test harness. And I could literally run simulations for this drone in a web browser. I could run it in a build pipeline through an automated test, or uh, I can run it on the physical device. And I can't think of any other technology, whether it's Java or .NET Core or anything else, that gives me that type of portability. I could write it all in C, but nobody wants to do that. Um, so the first thing I want to show is what ugly WebAssembly looks like. Um, we all need to know what... People keep telling me to stop showing the ugly WebAssembly code uh, because it's, it's definitely not, not pretty, but I think we should know, like the fact that WebAssembly only has four data types and the fact that WebAssembly can't do anything that the host won't let it do, um, we need to know what our code generators are building for us so that we can have an appreciation for when we do get Doom running on the web, we know how much is magic and how much is running inside WebAssembly. So, um, let me see if I can pop this up. Yeah, look, I had this all set up in demo mode and then I couldn't sleep, started coding, and went back to the wrong font size. So this is uh, what the text version of WebAssembly looks like. Has anybody seen this type of code before for WebAssembly? A couple. Uh, so the good news is you don't have to write this by hand. Uh, this is a text version of the bytecodes that are being read by either the browser or whatever runtime host you're in. And you know, just to kind of reiterate, the data, data types on these function parameters can only be integer, integers or floats. Uh, you can only do, and then you've got exports. Uh, so this makes this function called add available to the host. And so if my host is JavaScript, I can run this function. And you can see there's some JavaScript here. This is uh, just straight up regular JavaScript that just happens to uh, be compatible. Uh, and I believe most uh, modern browsers all support the, uh, the WebAssembly standard, so you should be able to run this anywhere. Uh, <clears throat> unless you're in an enterprise and all of your customers are running IE4 or something. And, uh, that's not a joke. That's that's, that's my nightmare. Um, so basically, we just we're loading the binary file up, and then we're using the JavaScript WebAssembly class. And you can think of this as that one of many runtimes. This WebAssembly instantiate is the JavaScript runtime for hosting a WebAssembly module. And I'll show a Rust runtime for hosting a WebAssembly module. Um, but you know, if I were to run this on you know web browser, you would see this in the console, and it all just looks as you would expect. But the point here is that anything beyond what you see here and the ugly WebAssembly that I just showed is all code generation. And uh, whether it was compiled by Rust or Go. It, it's all going to end up, at, at least today, looking something like this. And 
when as the WebAssembly spec grows and we get more potentially more data types or more robust ways to share data with the host, then theoretically our shims will shrink, but our develop while our developer experience gets better. So, uh, has anyone? I think there were a few hands from, from yesterday, but uh, who has compiled a, a Rust application or a library into WebAssembly? Okay, so this should be, this should also be a, a bit of a review, but I want to uh, continue just sort of building on the same code. So, this all looks pretty simple. This is just standard Rust. Uh, we saw in a couple of different presentations today the extern keyword which we use for FFI and pretty much all of the rules and guidelines and patterns and practices that apply to FFI apply to designing the public interface for your WebAssembly module. Um, I, I know there's, there's differing opinions, but I tend to try and isolate the, the piece of my Rust code that sits at the barrier between Rust and the, and the host, uh, and that way all of the rest of it uh, can be compiled for regular Rust use or for FFI or any other reason, and you know, we saw samples of that earlier. And so to run this, we just build it as a WebAssembly module and we could copy this file uh, into our directory and run the same thing from uh, WebAssembly or from JavaScript and uh, prove that we get the same results. Um, I don't expect to have a much spare time, so I'll, just, I'll skip that demo and you can just sort of I'll wave my hands and you, you can accept that that stuff works. So JavaScript integration um, for the one or two front-end web developers left in the world is uh, fairly important. And one of the reasons why I think Rust has an edge on, uh, over some of the other programming language communities is the libraries that it has for manipulating and interacting with JavaScript. So, uh, it's been mentioned a couple times today as well as yesterday during uh, the workshop that um, Wasm Bindgen is uh, using macros to generate a whole bunch of code and hopefully uh, now you've got a little bit of perspective on what exactly Wasm Bindgen is doing when it's generating the code. Um, at a low level it's adding functions to your WebAssembly module that can then be called again by the WASM BindGen CLI to uh, give it the metadata it needs to generate your JavaScript shims. And sadly, there isn't currently a version of WASM BindGen that generates, uh, that automatically generates a Rust host, so we still have to do that by hand, but uh, maybe someday. Um, so the, the two things that, that generally people use that get the biggest reaction uh, in JavaScript integration is you can import JavaScript uh, that, so that when it's imported, it just looks and behaves like it's regular Rust, and you can export native Rust so that it appears as though it's, just, it's regular JavaScript. And the, the real power of this library is how seamlessly it bridges that gap between the two so that when you're looking at JavaScript, you're not thinking, oh, this JavaScript came from Rust, like some other, you know, uh, transpiling libraries tend to do. They have these, some of these weird after effects. Uh, and again, Wasm by Gen generates a bunch of these uh, JavaScript shims to allow your code to talk to JavaScript. Uh, JSSys and WebSys are just essentially crates that define things that you're going to need to talk to JavaScript. So your basic JavaScript primitives, uh, functions like console log, uh, WebSys has the bindings that you need in order to 
uh, traverse the DOM and do manipulation, access some of the other functionality like WebGL, audio. Uh, has anyone seen JSS before, used it? Okay, a couple. Um, you know, essentially, you can think of it as you've got this JSS uh, crate prefix, and then inside that crate, you have access to Rust functions and native Rust structures that will eventually do their JavaScript equivalents. So this will actually call um, the JavaScript date now function. You, you can represent uh, JavaScript native null, create native JavaScript arrays, uh, everything that you need. Uh, WebSys essentially gives you access to the window, uh, and then through that you have access to the DOM. I don't have on there. So one of the other libraries that you so raise your hand if you actually do uh, front end development. I know it's rare, but you know if, if you do front end development. Uh, so if you're planning on doing, uh, if, if you're planning on exploring WebAssembly and you want to build a user interface, you uh, owe it to yourself to go look at a library called U Y E W. Uh, it's a Rust native library that gives you a uh, React Redux style uh, set of message passing in order to control a virtual DOM, and it all compiles into WebAssembly. And you know, if I have to do front end web development, uh, doing it in Rust isn't such a bad thing. So, uh, how many have you? How many have uh, hosted a WebAssembly module in Rust? All right, well, you, you guys need to stop raising your hands because <laughs> you're, um, So, as I said, um, I am uh, obviously biased towards back-end development and distributed systems and uh, cloud. And so being able to host the WebAssembly module in Rust is where I think some of the real power comes from. Not just because I like hosting stuff in Rust, but because if Rust can host it, then so too can uh, so many other things. Like I said, we don't currently have a, uh, we don't have a tool that generates all the magic smoke and mirrors that we do for JavaScript, so a lot of this stuff is still a little rough around the edges. There was a crate, or there still is a crate um, called WASME. I'm sure it's got a better pronunciation than that, but um, it came out of, uh, I think, Parity's work with uh, blockchain, and they were using it for uh, blockchain contracts. And as a result, the developer experience isn't designed for, um, you know, what I would consider just common everyday use. It's not a it's not a super friendly library. There's a new one uh, that sadly showed up after I finished writing my book called Wasmer, which build which is. Uh, it's got a couple of nice macros that make it really, really easy to uh, host uh, Rust, uh, to host WebAssembly modules in Rust. Uh, so, like I said, you can use it for serverless, uh, embedded IoT, microservices, uh, being able to uh, use WebAssembly modules everywhere that you used to be able to use a Lambda or a cloud function uh, is pretty appealing. Uh, I mentioned briefly that you can sign the module so that in your production environment you can guarantee that a particular WebAssembly module came from who says it came from and can do what they claim they can do. Yeah, let me just take a quick look at... Um, first embedded, here we go. So I've got a, a sample here that's just a, a Rust application that runs a uh, that runs and interprets a WebAssembly module. Uh, so the module just does. It's got a, uh, a function that logs a string from inside the WebAssembly module. So this is an export, uh, and then there's a function that will be exported called do work, and these imports and exports. Uh, 
operate the same way as they would if I were to be running this in JavaScript. Uh, so I can, I can compile this to WebAssembly, run it in a browser, and then I can run the same file unmodified, which is the, the real test of portability, uh, inside a Rust host. And to do that, I just use the WASMR runtime crate. And um, you know, I'm just obviously I'm just hacking around uh, to grab the bytes. You would get them from disk, or you'd get them injected through a network call in some sort of serverless environment. There's all sorts of ways you could get these bytes loaded into memory. But this section right here is essentially where all of or most of the WebAssembly magic happens. The setting the imports is explicitly telling your WebAssembly module what it can and can't do. If it's not in this import list, then your WebAssembly module can't do it. If you don't include the ability to print to standard out uh, through some import, your WebAssembly module can't do it. If, you've, if you show me a JavaScript app that is running a WebAssembly module that prints to the console, the only way it's happening is uh, through, through something like this. And it's because uh, we're getting so much of that JavaScript generated for us that we just kind of take it for granted. And uh, who uh, has heard of WASI or uh, was aware of that, the, the recent announcement? Okay, so not too many. Um, so right here I have a function that's being exported and it has a name called logster. That's obviously proprietary and only works on my sample. I lose portability when I take this module out of my Rust host and try and run it somewhere else where I don't get the logster import. So what WASI is trying to do is define a set of standards that can be injected into the imports of a WebAssembly module so that we do have portability. If we have uh, like WASI core, we should be able to assume that we'll be able to print the standard out from our WebAssembly module or read, for, read from a file or make a network call. And along the same vein as how the .NET core libraries are separated into separate sense of functionality, the, the idea, hopefully, is that we'll have WASI uh, runtimes that do just the basics, um, you know, essentially just running a calculator in a box to giving it standard out so that we can run it in serverless environments to uh, adding network access. And one of my favorites is hopefully we'll see uh, WASI standards for uh, embedded stuff like GPIO and I2C and other uh, hardware interactions. But it all comes through the, this list of imports. And then just like in the, the JavaScript, we call instantiate and we can run it. Um, so we'll see if... Yeah, I realize that's tiny. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll zoom in on it as soon as I can find the code sample. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so it's getting cut off a little bit, but. So I just ran my uh, my Rust console application that read a WebAssembly file from disk, uh, instantiated it through an interpreter, and uh, called do work, which has a, a for loop on the inside of the WebAssembly module that's calling it the logster function, and it calls it once inside each of those loops. So you can see that the WebAssembly module asked the host to log this text. And like I said, you can't, the WebAssembly module can't do that unless you give it that functionality. And so when we have uh, special runtimes 
for running WebAssembly applications. You know, Mozilla's got one, uh, Fastly just released one, and I'm sure that there will probably be another five or ten more fairly soon that are all specialized towards running WebAssembly modules in certain environments. Um, this is, I think, where the, the real power of WebAssembly and Rust uh, start to shine. So, um, you, know, you can do user interface if you want, but uh, this is the good stuff right here. So I wanted to get through the slides and just show a little bit of code so that uh, hopefully I'd have uh, plenty of time for questions. So, um, yeah, um, the main point is WebAssembly is, it's a great new technology. It's still early days, so there's still some rough edges around it and the direction is a little unclear, but uh, I think it has a, a promising future, especially with Rust. Uh, but it isn't a cure-all. You know, running WebAssembly everywhere doesn't make sense. So I think the, the next steps for all of us is to just figure out where it makes sense to run these WebAssembly modules and in what runtimes we should be running them. So that's it.